charge if I'm conforming. So there's never any change in precedent. How does that make sense to anybody? for my future you think you know what's happening in my head you elevate the people who choose bondage but god forbid i choose myself instead Hello, welcome to Theater Games on Pop Culture Co-op. My name is Maddie McClowski, and if this is your first time watching a pop culture co-op show, Pop Culture Co-op is a collective of artists who want to decenter conversations on pop culture and push back on the boys club dynamic when it comes to podcasting and the arts in general. Uh, theater games, if you've never watched our show, is a game where we interview creatives who have a love of theater but maybe went on a less conventional path. Today's guest is no exception. We have Miriam Poltro. She is an actor, composer, and writer who you may have seen playing Maureen in Rent at the Secret Theater. And you may have seen her in her award-winning performance in her series Mythos, which she also wrote. And she also, fun fact I learned today about my friend, uh, was the voice of Mewtwo in Pokemon the movie, Genesect, and The Legend Awakening. And I believe she's also other voices in the English dub, but... Most recently, you've probably seen Miriam's work online in Quarantine the Musical and her Bronte family rock opera, Glass Town, which if you were just listening to our opening, that's Miriam's music. You probably also heard her on the keyboard and singing because she is too talented. Uh, and P.S. If you would like to watch Glass Town, it is running through the Tanks online platform tonight. It opened last night. There's a performance tomorrow, and we're going to talk all about it. It's online, and you're going to be able to see it right after this show if you want. 
So um, I'm going to stop talking. Without further ado, here's my friend, Miriam Poltro. And we're on. Hi, Miriam. I muted myself. I was trying to be a good online citizen, and then I forgot I was muted. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> You are too good. Hi, how are you? Welcome to Theater Games. I'm very excited because I one I just found out you had a show this week, <laughs> so I didn't even know this existed. I'm I'm a slow adopter. Luddite is a term I heard used for that recently. So I like haven't gotten into Twitch. I've never seen a Twitch show. So yours is now the first. This well, is the first welcome. thing I ever saw on Twitch. <laughs> I I am honored. Uh, we're kind of pushing back on on. What is Twitch for? Who is Twitch for with Pop Culture Co-op? I am so happy you're on the show. Uh, before I ask the questions I ask every guest, can you let the kids at home know a little bit more about Glass Town? Yes. I uh, had this idea that the Bronte siblings, because there are four of them. I didn't know they had a brother for a long time. The three women are obviously well-known authoresses. Um, there are four of them. I am the oldest of four as well, much like Charlotte. I also have one brother, much like Charlotte. Um, and when they were kids, they wrote stories together. They developed their own imaginary world called Glass Town. And then as they grew older, they branched off into other things and continued to write stories. And they kind of, there were factions and uprisings. And then obviously they were published as adults. Um, and I suddenly had this idea right before the pandemic started that if they were they they'd overlay really well with a band concept because they all had like different styles and different interests and uh there are a lot of female trios that i listen to a lot of um musicians who work with their siblings i mean billy eilish came to mind today i was watching uh, a video of her brother phineas who's her only producer thus far talking about why he is very protective of working with her and and uh, how he sees his work as supporting her career, which was cool. So both this concept, like the family band idea and them building their, what they literally made things together. I was like, that's a band. They're a band. <laughs> I love that. Um, so I want to know, uh, since you and I both love rock music and we love musical theater and it's hard to truly marry both um, do you have advice for performers auditioning for rock musicals as someone who writes and produces them? Whoa. Um, choose something you love singing. Choose something that makes you sound good. Um, I think that, especially as someone who did audition for a lot of musical theater back in the day, um, I spent too much time worrying about what was right for the role and not what was right for me. Um, a lot of the music that I've written has been written now with specific collaborators in mind. And I personally like to write things for unusual voice types that I don't see represented because musical theater has become a very narrow concept. We train vocalists to sound a certain way and then all of the scores get written for those voices alone. And I'm a, I'm a mezzo, but I sing low. And I know people who are like true, true sopranos who sing very, very high. And there's, there's not a lot that caters to um, the diversity of the human voice. So I say, just choose choose something that's good for you. And I feel like that that will make it clear what your gifts are and then whether or not people are going to employ them. That's a really good point. I think um, I read this in an interview years ago with Adina Menzel before the world knew her as a Disney princess. Uh, a lot of, I think, people who aren't in the insider baseball theater world may not know that Adina Menzel was in bands before she booked Rent. And so when she was in her 20s, she was not unlike you when you were younger in that she wasn't just musical theater. She was a working artist. And she mm -hmm. didn't just listen to show tunes. She listened to rock music. And she said in an interview once that a huge difference between how people are taught to sing for musical theater versus how they're taught to sing for rock music is that all the keys are different. And so musical theater actors go in thinking that they have to belt as high as a musical theater score 
so they'll transpose their rock cut up or everyone sings alone by heart. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I love knowing that from her because I don't know her well as a, uh, like a behind the scenes as an artist, like her personality and her, her she's, takes on things. But I appreciate that. things that are really cool, like that I, that makes sense now knowing like her whole career. Mm -hmm. Like she talks a lot about how musical theater has a pressure to like, there's this pressure in fandom of musical theater as well as in the industry where it's like every note has to be perfect and she's like, no, if 70% of the notes you hit when you're doing an eight show a week run, if you've hit 70%, that's a passing grade. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like things, things are variable. Not, not to say like, don't worry about getting it right. But there's, there's something to be said for like choosing your battles, how you feel on the day. It's a physical, like you don't, you're not a sprinter you don't like train 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 and then have like five seconds to do everything at one shot you've got to sustain it you've got to be able to uh what's the word i'm looking for like budget. there's that aphasia again budget yeah that's a really great way to see it yeah um the woman who directed glass town daniela um isn't a musician um doesn't really she doesn't read music self-acknowledge this is not me slandering her by any means she was absolutely the right person to direct the show we love you daniela um but she said multiple times while we were rehearsing she's more she's more interested in the interpretation than getting every note right and there's a lot of emotional music in the show and a lot of it is emo-esque um and i also listened to so much music that went into the writing of the show and particularly male rock artists are doing a lot of interesting vocal things choices for sure it's absolutely like a mastery of the sound they're going for but 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 their choices are not get the pitch fucking right every time oh absolutely those I are mean, not the choices <laughs> i mean there's a reason why there is an entire generation who hears the intro to i miss you by blink 182 yeah. <laughs> girds their long loins and it's like where are you and i'm so sorry <laughs> like we all can do so it. distinct yeah and it's yeah. like you wouldn't go into you know telsey and can you imagine like, sing somebody gimme, done it gimme, but as blink 182 singing if someone ever does that to me i will hire them on the spot <laughs> okay miriam i'll do it right <laughs> now <laughs> don't test me i will do it on the air i've done dumber things so <laughs> fly dove sing sparrow give me fat boys famous hero am i hired yes okay great i'm Done. so glad that's actually why we've I heard enough show. thank you for coming um sign your paperwork on the way out i'm so glad thank you i need health insurance this is so great <laughs> oh my oh. god oh uh since you are playing someone who is often brought up in conversations of like feminism and lit and representation i want to know what your favorite and least favorite strong female leads in musical theater are oh wow um <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> blank because i'm not gonna be able to think of it can you hear the siren by the way i mean it's new york Too yeah she's coming can. up a little bit but it's fine it's authentic it's hot. favorite and least favorite strong female lead um i can't remember the character's name but i really love um she's not even the lead it's the character that Leah Delaria played in On the Town, like in the 90s. Oh, um, uh, oh, She's the taxi Hilda. driver, and I think it's On the Town. I think Hildy, it's Hilda. Hilda. Yeah. I really, I think that there's obviously some dated uh, interpretational aspect to that character, but I remember watching the movie as a kid, and it's Ann Miller, I'm pretty sure, in the movie. And she is, she's a horny, go-getter type lady, and she doesn't give a fuck what people think, and she is after frank sinatra who's like itty bitty skinny boy at the time but very pretty and like and he's just he swoons for her and i love that because it's such it was like the first time i'd really seen a non-conventional dynamic portrayed yeah in a still very heterosexual you know way but it was like it it was it was like permission to be funny and um pushy <laughs> <laughs> yeah and well, she's got a big personality she knows what she wants and it's like that is generally played as such a negative thing and i felt like it was it was it was a positive thing for once 
yeah, the show kind of reinforced it by letting the love happen. Yeah, like yeah. It wasn't like she was after. It. it wasn't like she was this gross person who was after him, and he was after like the actual pretty ingenue. Right. I mean, Ann Miller's hot as fuck too. Like, oh, I mean, real. but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I love Ann Miller, Stan Buckley, um, least favorite Lord in Heaven. Uh, can we come back to this? I'm going to be thinking sure. about it for the rest of the night. I heard a hot take on TikTok from a young person that I th- almost sent to you and I didn't because I wanted to tell you this on air. Uh, the account's name is at not Kristen Bell. And she's this like probably 22 year old blonde young woman who I think is about to graduate theater school. And I think she's a dramaturg. I think. Or she's like a straight acting major. Like she definitely got the BFA. Uh, But she talks about how she's like, I think Louisa May Alcott would hate Little Women the musical. And I think the character of Joe would never sing Astonishing. Or she wouldn't write her own story in a way where she would give herself the 11 o'clock number. And I thought that was an interesting take. On. That's a very interesting take because now I have so many questions. Right? Yeah. I uh, she she's such an online popular young person. I'm very intimidated, but I'm obsessed with her take. And it felt that's like amazing. I that recognize I that handle. Yeah. Yeah. Because she like looks that's enough, a because like, they... Kristen Bell that people would be, <laughs> she probably gets it a lot. <laughs> so she made her name not Kristen Bell. Uh, that's fast. I am looking at the wall behind you to get ideas. I know that I can't say with absoluteness that this is my least favorite, but I loathe the way the women of Hamilton have been written and oh, that they God. are also upheld as strong female characters. Gonna... No, they're not. By what metric? By what metric? The show is about three women all in love with the same man. Come on. Like... <laughs> Helpless is the worst song in the show. I have a lot of hot takes. Anyway. I, uh, we love hot takes here. Um, as you know, <laughs> our last guest, Jess Henderson, like came in hot and was like, I'm going to get canceled. And I was like, let's go. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll get canceled, but I also don't know how much of my opinions you want to hear. <laughs> All of them. That's why I have you on my show. Of course. <laughs> I think uh, what... Uh, most recently there was a piece that came out about um, one actor's experience in the touring company of Hamilton about how his dream was you know met with the reality of structural racism in professional theater even in this progressive piece you're nodding you've read it Um, I I haven't read the whole thing but I know what you mean to which you refer yeah Uh, there's something to be said for um, art that is upheld for being progressive as a way to uh, safeguard against critique for its internal um, isms. You know, like everybody Mm -hmm. watched Buffy and said, oh my God, it's feminist. So they never questioned that Joss Whedon perhaps was not behaving to those ideals. And you can yeah. say a lot about yeah. that with Hamilton as well. Um, I have questions that I ask every guest, and I forgot to ask them. Uh, how did theater first come into your life? I knew when I was a baby that my parents had done theater. They met doing a production in the 70s. Um, so I was aware of it as a thing, and... I don't remember if I had seen like been taken to see something. I never, I never made it to a Broadway show until I was in my twenties. Um, I don't remember if like, I think we went to see the Nutcracker once, you know, when I was a little kid. Um, I was very into dance as a wee girl, but it was not, not to be. Um, and when I was 11, we finally got involved in the same children's theater group that my mom had worked with when she was a kid oh, um wow. and we went out for our first oh we also did i i know what it is i suddenly remembered my dad directed a musical at church when i was five it was like a christian thing that had made the made the rounds in the 80s and 90s called sir oliver's song and it's sir oliver is an owl 
who like teaches people to be kind and love each other and whatever. So it's about an hour long. It's mostly adults or older kids, but, but um, he let his, my sister Rachel and I were in it and we sang a song with Sir Oliver. And that was like my first, wow. I just remembered that. So wow. I was about five. I was on That's stage so for the first time. Exciting. Oh, wow. Um, everybody who comes on the show has a different path and I'm expressly kind of not including cookie cutter musical theater actors who have come into the industry in conventional ways. So I want to know how has your relationship to theater impacted the life you have now? Oh, um, I moved to New York to get involved in theater, to be doing theater. That was the point of coming here. Um, and a couple years in realized I was not very good at it. And when I say not very good, I don't mean not talented. I wasn't good at musical theater. I wasn't what was being cast. I almost got cast as Eponine a couple of times because I was like, there's a role that I was kind of vocally right for. And I was kind of this, I'm above average height for a cis woman. And so, you know, a lot of the girls turned out of musical theater schools are five foot three. And I'm already almost too tall for some of the actors to be paired with them in a traditional heterosexual way. And <laughs> I wasn't a dancer. <laughs> I did not have 15 years of dance under my belt. And uh, it was very frustrating, but it took me a long time to figure out what I was actually good at. So I kind of pivoted into film and then I wasn't tied to New York anymore. Like New York was home, but I moved overseas for a couple of years and then ironically got back involved in theater. <laughs> the theater so I feel like now I'm back like, in New York. But like, What is the theater world like in Australia? You were in Australia, right? How hot do you want these takes? Yes, I wasn't. I I, um, I like spicy. I would like chili oil spicy. takes. All right, please. Um, the, musical theater in particular is terrible in Australia. Um, it is in large part because the population is a lot smaller. They and it is a truly like American and British art form. Um, it, it it works pretty well, like new musical creation and juggernauts and stuff that have come out of the West End. But mostly it's Broadway. People associate the word Broadway with musical theater. And so the shows that are getting produced in Australia are like cheaper Aussie knockoffs of American musicals. And then like once in a blue moon, there'll be an original show. And the, the people there who are into musical theater are very into it. They're very, you know, like we're passionate about musical theater. We love musical theater. And I'm, I feel like they just are missing it's not that they don't get trained. It's not that they can't sing. It's not that the skill set isn't there. There's some aspect of musicals that is is lost in translation, literally by the distance. And I think because so much of the material is American and not Australian, it is. I, I don't know how to say it. I just I felt like I'm, the the new works being promoted. I. <laughs> Here's a, an example that's unrelated, but I think will prove the point. I never read a single bad review of a band gig or an album the entire time that I was there. And it's not because all the music is that good. That is not why. There is, a, there is an infrastructure that supports artists in a healthy way. They make sure people get paid. Almost all events are ticketed, but there's also live music playing in the front of every bar. Um, there is a lot more to be said about um, the literal monetary infrastructure of like how they're supporting artists. But I feel like there's no critique or very little. That's fascinating. And I, I too have noticed that folks who are from Australia who come visit, um, we, everyone on air knows I work at Marie's Crisis, the show tune sing-along <laughs> piano bar in the West Village. We don't have to be cagey about it. Uh, and that's how Miriam and I met. And um, we get a lot of tourists from Australia. And we have actually had folks who work at Marie's go have pop-up events in Australia and right. be parts of uh, the fringe festivals out there as like ticketed events and uh, they love it and they appreciate it so mm -hmm. much and they're always so sweet. And I'm wondering if part of that cultural sweetness is also maybe um, 
a lack of discerning. I wonder if being online in Australian communities is perhaps a little different than being online in American circles. Meaning fewer uh, people spewing vitriol online? Yeah, that was actually (laughs) the word I was going to, that's exactly how I was going to put it. Have you had that experience? I feel like it's probably the same. It's probably the same. That's fair. No, I met some, I actually had a, a run of like terrible male bosses for a year and a half there. So I, I don't think that there are differences in culture for sure, but the problems are the same problems. That tracks. If that makes sense. That absolutely does. Um, I like I don't get know... whistled at on the street, but I've also never been chewed out by like openly screamed at by a grown man in the States. And it happened frequently there, <laughs> like, you know, just like what? Okay. Sorry. Continue. Holy... No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I show me yes, where all men. Are um, <laughs> when we when we go off air. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna go back and burn their bars down. Okay, great. When Glass Town blows up and I have a million dollars, we're gonna. <laughs> uh, we'll I'm going turn to use it to venues for for uh. We'll buy uh, what's them the word out. I'm for? We'll buy them out. Let's do it. We'll set yeah. up the first good <laughs> musical theater venue in the town. There we go. We'll or we'll um support. New Sorry to all of my musical critics. theater friends in Australia too. Or maybe they just need dramaturgs. <laughs> maybe we can fix it. I think that's part of it too. I yeah. mean, I think American theater has been pretty behind on dramaturgy as a practice rather than as an occasional band aid. <laughs> I think it should yeah. be. I mean, I don't think that's a hot take. Band-aid. There should be historical context and research done. Um, Speaking of Mm -hmm. uh, research and learning, what is the most useful thing you have learned from watching and creating and loving theater? Oi. I don't know. I'm terrible at answering questions. Um, (laughs) The useful thing, the most useful thing I've learned from watching theater. That question doesn't work for me. I'm going to answer your question a different way. Yeah, go for it. Um, <laughs> I just don't know how to answer it. Um, oh, well, like, yeah, no, I can use this answer to answer it. Um, the importance of learning music theory, because yeah. it is, seems to be sorely overlooked in theater training, in musical theater training, which scares me to death, because I'm like, how do you learn music if you don't know how to? Um I have a friend who isn't a tremendous singer and does read music, but she, she mentioned to me that she tested out, like they, they didn't make her take the musicality class in her freshman year of college because she was skilled enough from her high school experience that they were like, Oh, you don't need this. And it was like, and then she's like, but I wish that I'd had it now because it would make this so much easier. It'd be, I'd be able to see what you mean when you point out that note you need me to fix. Um, do you still teach I mean there's a lot of great theory? music being made but you used to teach I tried music no one ever wanted to I I wanted to teach music theory <laughs> um, I will you... talk music theory to anyone who will listen when glass town closes everyone go to at Miriam Poltro it is underneath her name and slide into her DMs <laughs> appropriately Please and ask for music, music theory, to theory lessons uh if i had the money i would be taking music theory lessons from you because you were absolutely right that there's two things in the culture of training in musical theater that both kind of make this terrible we're constantly told i mean it would be nice to know how to read but as long as you're a quick study it's fine and then there's this pressure to not give an honest answer about your abilities and always upsell yourself because you're desperate for oh, the gig. Yeah. So you're always like, yeah, yeah. I can I can do that. It, it, even if you don't feel as great about it. So I always lowball it cuz I can I can read music. Like I can there's basic parts of music theory that I do know, but I'm not mm-hmm. like an awesome instrumentalist and I'm also terrified of sight singing in front of people uh alone oh yeah don't make me do i don't want to if i'm in a choral setting unless i'm drunk at marie's oh yeah yeah um it's oh so i just tell people that i'm stupid (laughs) like that's my move i'm like "Mm, yeah no i mean i know i feel like we need to find a balance in there 
<laughs> Maybe. I'm just like, I know, like, the, the ideas behind chord progressions and, like, what intervals are. But, like, and I know yeah. that when the note goes up, you go up. And when the note stays the same, you stay the same. And I know the names of marks on pages. But, like, otherwise, don't call me a musician. Because that's terrifying pressure. Uh, Contradictorily to that, if I may, for a moment. Yeah. Um, there's also, contrastingly with everything I just said about the importance of music theory, there is this idea that if you are not trained to do a thing, you are not good at the thing which I also resoundingly disagree with because there are musicians who have never read a note in their life. They're, I mean, like if you think the difference between classical music and folk music, to me, those are like opposite ends of the spectrum. Folk music being anything that is kind of rootsy, culturally grounded. Um, folk musicians don't necessarily read music, but would you say they're not music? I mean, like, I don't think anyone would say they're not musicians. They're not good. They're just not good at this thing. They're not good at classical. Like I'm not a classical musician. I don't want to ever be a classical musician. That's years of training that I have no interest in doing for results that I don't really care about. Sure. But like as a folk musician, I'm somewhere in between. I'm like, I've got a bit of training here. I've got a bit of this and I, I'm not a guitarist, but I'm a musician. Amazing. I also, Sorry to uh, I think I have one last question that is not one that I ask every guest, but it might turn into one, and I was inspired by you to add it. Uh, what is one myth you would like to dispel about being a working artist in theater? That you have to suffer to make art, and that if you are not part of the system that you are not an artist. Those are really important things. I, I think we all were sold this romanticized starving artist thing. I think especially millennials, uh, because we were told you can do anything, you can be anything, be yourself. And then when we expressed interest in professionally pursuing the arts we were then fed you're going to be a starving artist and so when we you know gave the proverbial middle finger to that advice or whatever it was uh it was like i'm gonna be like mark and roger in rent and i'm gonna be a starving who artist have the resources to do better and refuse them they don't call their moms back and like you know you know that Mark and Rogers, especially Mark's, and probably Maureen's families, uh, were were giving them grocery money, were coming oh, into the city and buying them the things they needed to survive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so now that we've in uh, answered all our interview questions, I thought I'd warm up for games with a tailored to you game of uh, would you rather, uh, would you rather be in a rock band with Andrew Lloyd Webber or be in a musical with someone from your favorite pop punk band? Oh, that is a hard question. I'm going to say be in a musical with someone from my favorite pop punk band. But Andrew Lloyd Webber would be an excellent rock musician. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree I think, with you. Like just for kicks, that would be an amazing opportunity. Yeah. So I want to know uh, what is your favorite pop punk band and what is your favorite Andrew Lloyd Webber musical? I'm going to say Blink-182. Because yeah. I didn't listen to a lot of pop punk. It was a lot more like emo or like melodic hardcore. But okay. to me, Blink defines pop punk and like, especially for my generation. And I still listen to all of their music. Still really good. Yeah. And funny. Yes. And very enjoyable to it, me. It blows my mind that more people don't audition for musical theater with pop punk as comedy songs because i often have a very hard time choosing comedy songs unless i'm like oh i could do the girl that's all the bad genius. guys want by bowling for soup and like that's funny that's, incredible. that's brilliant wait that's, is bowling for yeah. soup adam schlesinger's band no no that's fountains of wayne also 
Thank you. Fountains of Wayne. Anything books. he's ever written, hot Amazing. tip. Anything he's ever written is essentially musical theater in different genres. Yeah. And like he's, was... it, his gifts were blending of genre and humor and like brilliant songwriting. And that's why he <laughs> was perfect for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I, I can't believe it's almost been a year since we lost Mark Schlesinger. Oh my God. Uh yeah. What is your favorite emo band? Since I, I, you and I are both very particular about our like rock band classification. What's your favorite emo band? I'm terrible at this. I'll say MCR because I'm listening to them a lot recently, but I know that wasn't true when they were around. I was not really familiar with their music at the time that they were making it. Interesting. I was very late to that party. I I'm knew so the Black Parade. Black Parade was everywhere. Everywhere. But <laughs> thank you. I was, but listening, I was listening to, that to a lot album more to Christian pop. music. So <laughs> I mean, Christian music is. So it was pop probably punk. probably. There's a lot that, and they, there were. I mean, like actually good. I there's still some music that. Oh, um, there's this band I want to plug called Ace Troubleshooter that has since broken up. But I've been listening to their stuff a lot too, and they're they're walking that fine line. Like they obviously have some pop punk sensibilities. I love his voice and I love his songwriting, and I can't remember his name. Um, but Ace that band is brilliant and their, their albums are like, yeah, like 2004, 2006, all of their stuff holds up. And I've been listening to them a lot again recently and I love the music so much. Yeah. I, I, when I was listening to what you sent me from Glass Town, the vibes that I got were MCR and Christian rock, like instantly. And also that's not just because I know you and I knew, but like those are sonically what's happening. Um, yeah, it's, I love it. Um, I have another, would you, oh, wait, what was your favorite Andrew Lloyd Webber show? Oh, uh, probably Jesus Christ Superstar. Yep. Which I don't know as well as a lot of his other works. Like, I was, again, late to that party. We weren't allowed to listen to it growing up. Of course. Um, it was, Godspell was fine. Jesus as a clown is fine. But yeah. Judas getting a rock solo is not okay. <laughs> well, also, like... <laughs> It's it, it so funny that like a lot of a lot of church theater communities felt very similarly to your family, where it was like Godspell, yes, Jesus Christ Superstar, mm -hmm. absolutely not. And I was like, I love that they're like just putting money in the pocket of small Jewish Stephen Schwartz for his clown hippie Jesus musical. I love Godspell too, by the way. I love Godspell. I feel like it is unfairly maligned. It is always like said in, in a you know a tone where like, oh God, if you like Godspell, you don't know what taste is. That kind of feeling is what I've gotten a lot the last years, and I'm just like too bad. I am old enough, and I know myself well enough to be like, you're fucking wrong. Um, by my but side, you don't have to like it. A great <laughs> song. On it's the a Willow folk song, folk music, yeah. It, it, we didn't know what we had because everyone's like, oh yeah, every song in Godspell, like you have like a four phrase, you know, refrain that just gets repeated. And it's like, yeah, that's how pop music works. They're hymns. Yeah. They're hymns. They They're took hymns. the hymns, they took the, the lyrics out of hymnals and wrote new music. Yep. That's literally what they are. Turned Back Man is in a hymnal somewhere. Like, yeah. <laughs> It's well, and, and it's like taking it's content dictates form like so it musically works the way a hymn works and that's why everybody can sit in a production of Godspell and near the end of you know you're like oh we beseech thee hear us and everybody's there's in. always a choral sing back section and yep 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 absolutely oh I, I wrote this question without knowing your answer about your favorite pop punk band would you rather have a Blink-182 song added to a revival production of a classic musical, or would you rather have Blink-182 cover a song from a classic musical on one of their albums? The latter. What song would you like? I would love to. Oh, God. Something from Godspell. Um, 
We beseech they would be a great pop punk song. Not gonna oh, lie. Yeah, with the drums and the boom, chicka boom, chicka boom. <laughs> Father here, die children. Is it totally a pop punk song? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Godspell is pop punk. That's the next revival. Tom DeLong is We Beseech Thee. <laughs> uh, oh god just involves something with like aliens because isn't he doesn't he like very... he's a big yeah i think he believes in aliens and yeah, yeah. which i mean who among get a us show about it for a while who among <laughs> us? i can't say that i don't believe in aliens that's true i i i think to not believe in aliens is a little naive uh <laughs> okay would you rather write a musical based on your middle school diary or based on your worst first date? I'm going to say middle school diary because I think there's more fodder there. Uh, what what would the what would the sound in that show be? What would the sound in that show be? I feel like uh, acoustic pop. That'd be cute. Like lots of acoustic guitar, maybe some ukulele, a recorder. Like think about instruments that middle schoolers play. Ooh. Free idea. Somebody take it. I don't have time to write or another like, musical right Yeah, now. or like, like choral kazoos. Would I always you... think about things in like context too. The context would be if if I was writing a musical about middle school or based on my middle school diary, then it has to, like the music has to be contact dictates form. The, the music has to be able to be played or performed by middle schoolers. So like that'll affect the, the vocal ranges that I write and the appropriateness of the material. <laughs> that was actually what I was about to ask. I was going to ask, would you want middle schoolers uh, that age performing it or would it be adults playing children? I like the choice of having young people in it and having another show for young people yeah there's not enough of that there's it's like there's this um kids are so unfairly young people are so unfairly dismissed and yet they're the taste makers like if teenagers like something and at, at that point by the time you got into middle school you basically have your personality and you've, you've developed some taste and you you think independently to a degree and you know it's not always uh, allowed to flourish and it's not always respected or listened to. And I think that's so unfair, um, but there's not a lot that caters to young people. There's children's shows and then there's adult stuff that kids can watch or participate in. Like the first show that I did was Oliver. <laughs> it was a bunch of children doing, I played Nancy and Oliver and the way they made that appropriate for children was they illegally, like tiny children's theater in Philadelphia, they just wrote Bill Sykes out of it. So there was no Bill Sykes. Wait, but I am literally a 12 year old girl plot? playing a sex worker as an adult. Like it just, mm, why didn't we do Annie? There needs to, there needs to be art that children I mean, there's still a sex worker participate in, in. Like, I mean, Fair. do we think, do we think Lily St. Regis is a sugar baby? No, he's not wealthy. Or you That's mean to somebody true. else? Or maybe to someone else. I think yeah. they're both just low class people, but not necessarily. Uh, I don't think either of them is particularly employed. Oh, because I thought Lily St. Regis. <laughs> she's was just a like fake a sugar name. baby wannabe. I thought it was a. Fake oh, it totally name is. So that she could. I think uh, she's do her business. She's stupid in trying to make herself look. Oh, interesting. That never occurred to me. Who knows? That's an interesting take. Um. <laughs> uh, would you rather write a musical? Who um hates your favorite book or write a web series with someone who hates my chemical romance write a musical with someone who hates my favorite book what's your favorite book probably sabriel um a young adult novel from the 90s i was like the right age to read it it was the first time i wrote, written by an australian author um it was the first book that i had read ever where the protagonist looked like me and felt like me like she's she's a bit of a an introverted 17 year old she's kind of tall and lanky and she's got dark hair and she sets off on this adventure to go find her missing dad and um it's it's fantasy but it's got this like 1920s 
style element to it and the magic in the magic world is very dark and wild she's essentially the the opposite of a necromancer so she puts the dead back to sleep with bells and i'm like this is the coolest book ever it's still the coolest book ever (laughs) go read Gabriel. everyone who's watching there are people (laughs) in the co-op especially who will love that book are there people watching for sure Gabriel by garth nix yes amazing um so would you rather be known as a rock artist who writes for theater or as a musical theater person who writes rock operas uh a rock musician who writes musical theater i knew that was gonna be because as a wise human once once said so efficiently and correctly musical theater is a medium not a genre Yes. And it ought to be. That's yes. you. I'm quoting you. Oh, I, I mean, I wasn't the first person to say that. <laughs> I wasn't. I, I oh, heard it I from... I've similar things over the years, but I'm, I got that from you. Oh, and I was that like, that's a brilliant so way to put it. Yeah. It's... I've been passing that along. That makes me really happy. I heard that from uh, David Levy. Uh, he's at It's D Levy on Twitter. And he uh, hosted the, or I believe still hosts, the Maximu Theater Arts Podcast. Uh, and that okay. is where I first heard it from. That makes me really happy. Cool. And I, I consider you a rock writer who writes musicals as well. Like, especially with Glass Town. It's super clear. Uh, one more time for anyone who may have missed it. How can someone see Glass Town tonight? or tomorrow and is there another chance people can see glass town there is um it's streaming now tonight it started at 7 30 which is fine you can cancel this and go watch if you want get a ticket but you can watch it tomorrow at 2 30 um p.m eastern standard time um and then it's going to be on demand for two weeks so the same exact show we're obviously not performing it live we pre- pre-recorded everything it's filmed been edited together it's like watching a movie uh, but we filmed it on a stage in a theater uh, starting, I think, tomorrow night. It's on demand for two weeks. So if you buy a ticket for the on demand, you get a rental for 72 hours. Um, it's the tanknyc.org. And I would recommend not clicking the button that says get your tickets here because I think that's set up to the link for tickets for last night specifically. And I've gotten some texts from friends today where they're like, there's an error message. And I'm like, it, go to the calendar. So go to the calendar at, the t- at their menu bar, the tanknyc.org and click either for tonight or tomorrow. And then they also have another tab that says on demand and that'll be available starting tomorrow night, I think. Okay, amazing. Cause I want the on demand option for me. And so I knew that option (laughs) existed, but I couldn't find it when I was looking for it. So that makes sense. It's going to become available tomorrow. Uh, Correct. If you, I, I know that people watching like the arts and I know that people watching like rock music and especially supporting projects that are um, led by not men, (laughs) shall we say. (laughs) I would also like to point out my entire creative team for this show was women. I love Um, We had some men involved, obviously. They're fine. They did great work. (laughs) Um, And it wasn't something nice necessarily set out to achieve, but it's like, it's three women in the cast, or, you know, the characters are three women and a man. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the, the woman who played Emily also was her music director. Amazing. God, the work that woman put in. Um, And then our director, Daniela, also a woman. Um, And then my good friend, Steph Bonner, who filmed this, was our director of photography, also a woman, so been a joy to work with such a female heavy team i love that yeah I, and that is everything that pop culture co-op is about uh which is why I'm, i feel very lucky i get to have you on the show uh we do have time for another game a very quick little game so instead of truth or dare um it's a band or literary topic and basically either i will give you a band and you tell me what literary property or figure they will musicalize or vice versa i will give you a literary figure or a book and you tell me what rock band you would like to make the musical out of them 
Does that oh, make wow. sense? Oh, wow. Yes, I think so. Okay. <laughs> so, for like, easy one. Uh, if My Chemical Romance was to make a musical about a an existing classic book or a literary figure, who would you, what would you want them to musicalize? The picture of Dorian Gray. <gasps> Oh, I'm obsessed. I'm a genius. <laughs> oh, I'm obsessed. Oh, send a thirst trap with that pitch to Gerard Way and get no, yourself a producing married with a child. Oh, we're not doing thirst traps for sure. I mean, we and don't know. For like 15 years. We don't know the terms of their marriage, Miriam. They could be That's open. true. But I also see him more as a someone I'd like to collaborate with than Bone. Um, sure. He was very, very cute in his, you know, at the height of his he powers. Sure and I feel like he settled, he settled into a healthier, happier place. Now he seems very content in his home life. He's spoken openly about his mental health struggles and getting sober. And um, I, love that. I don't know the terms of their relationship, but I know he's been with his wife since he was very, very famous. And I love that. He I wasn't like it. a party animal. Oh, my chemical romance is <laughs> the picture of Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray. That's absolutely bananas done okay. mic drop <laughs> yeah mic drop so now this is a fun game <laughs> um if you were to choose a band to write a musical about f scott fitzgerald what band would you choose uh it's not a band but a, rather an artist gary clark jr who plays like southern blues guitar and sings mm -hmm. and while i think maybe other people don't this is where i feel like my gifts are not stri strictly musical theater thinking i think that there is something about the style of music that he does that could translate very easily to kind of a 1920s feel i love that which i think would be cool well i think there's also like there's there's a, a midsection between you know, the composer themselves and their body of work and the piece that they're making. And there's that little connective tissue of like, what do we want to highlight when we're adapting this property or talking about this real life person? And how can we translate that and teach the audience through these tools? Uh, which is mm -hmm. something I think you do very well with what I have seen of Glass Town. Uh, because it's not just you're not making a documentary you're making a musical no 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 mm -hmm. and that's the fun thing about theater however you define it that like there's so much more room to play not that you can't play with film but you have you're limited to a box you're limited to the tools that you have but i feel like theater so much theater gets made that seems to not think creatively about what it can be and what it means yeah, I think uh, the mega musicals and the commodification of theater as the only way it survives and and how Broadway currently works uh, makes for a product that is often less about thought and more about profit. Sure, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, speaking, I, uh, there's a lot of dudes. I've given you a lot of dudes. So I want to know what literary figure or property should be adapted into a musical by Paramore. <gasps> what can you do with Paramore? Um, oh, I just, I blanked. Who was it? Um... Damn it! Someone I just found out about. Okay, so I'm I'm not pitching this actually because I know somebody who wants to work on it, but I just found out about uh, a person named Ida Tarbell, who essentially took down, invented journalism basically single-handedly, and then took down Rockefeller, like with because she basically exposed the i haven't read any of this she wrote a very famous book basically like did years of research and like took the rockefeller emperor apart empire apart by herself and she was like 
a middle-aged woman who never married. Ooh. I love and I know somebody who, who has the an idea to write something about her. Like, it's not my idea. I don't want to, mm-hmm. um, but they had mentioned that to me and I didn't want to blow them up. But I feel like some something that would be, um, even if Haley wasn't performing in it, like writing about yeah, someone like writing. a Nellie Bly, like a, like a, a, a mm-hmm. like a, a, a writer, yes, but not necessarily a conventional, like, oh, I write books. Like not Emily Dickinson. No. Or, you know, like that wouldn't be, I don't feel like that would be a good fit for for that band i mean the only if if emily dickinson was going to be musicalized i would want it through the aesthetic of the apple tv plus show dickinson and like with music have you by seen lord. it yeah oh see lord there's a is is lord's music in it that sounds like a great fit i mean it's not That's but cool... it might as well be like aesthetically speaking yeah. I, I love lord <laughs> um <laughs> so uh, now in the inverse um if there was going to be a musical about Virginia Woolf and it had to be written by an existing rock band that you like, who would you assign to the Virginia Woolf musical? Um, I can't remember the exact name of the band, the trucks band, the, the, let me Google it real quick for you. There's a guitarist named Derek trucks and he's in the band. And then, his wife, who's older than him and has this like raspy, bluesy voice, is their lead singer. It might just be the Derek. Uh, Tedeschi Trucks Band. His wife is blues singer, guitarist Susan Tedeschi. She sounds like she could play something who lived a hard life for, you know? She's just got this like amazing voice. I would love for it to be someone who is a more mature woman. Of course. Like older than I am now. I would love it to be someone who's. And an unusual, like somebody who's maybe not, um, not refined, like not a Renee Fleming type sure. voice or something. I would love for it to be somebody who's got some life she's lived. <laughs> I love that so much. All right. We are wrapping up, but uh, Miriam, thank you for coming and playing theater games. I'm so proud of you. It was a complete you. joy. Thank uh, you. And everyone watching, uh, you can take little notes of the buy ticket link that is it's not clickable but it's just a little pink uh rectangle that has the link to the tank and uh i hope that you enjoy glass town i'm very excited to see it and uh i i'm unsure at this moment if we are having a trollopsism uh broadcast after this uh, in light of this week's events. Um, but if trollopsism is on, it will be a space if folks, um, need to take a minute and process, uh, this week. And if not, they will be back, uh, with their scheduled programming in the upcoming weeks. So I'll see you in two weeks on Theater Games. Thank you for watching Pop Culture Co-op, and I'll catch you in two weeks. Bye! You only want to see me at the forefront if I'm pretty. You always favor those who fall for your pretense. You only want to see me lead the charge if I'm conforming. So there's never any change in precedent. How does that make sense to anybody? Don't tell me I can't be anything I want to be in this life. You always pretend that you're not the reason I break. I know better. You're imposing your ideals for my future. You think you know what's happening in my head. You elevate the people who choose bondage. But God forbid I choose myself instead. You always say I can't paint a clearer picture of what I know. So I paint the truth and you say it's too hard to take.
serving lies to make you feel better. I know you, you try to blame my ideals on my youth. Don't to anybody.